So before I start this video, I just want to say that this video is fair use, so all the media used in this video is used for criticism, review, or in a transformative way. All the information I present is public information, and everything else is alleged, a joke, or just my opinion. I've been really inconsistent with like these little facts that I was going to present at the start of my videos, and I don't really know how to transition into them. But I want to talk about when people say that there are no racist laws, at least in America or Australia, Canada, wherever the fuck they are. So when you're talking about racist laws and stuff like that, you usually separate it into de jure and de facto laws. De jure means that the law is explicitly racist. Like if I made a law that said black people are not allowed out at the front of the bus that would be blatantly racist and therefore de jour. However, de facto talks about how the law is applied. So it's not explicitly racist, but it is used in order to disadvantage people of color. So America didn't have like a fully functioning national incarceration system until slavery ended because there were now millions of black people out here that weren't slaves and they need jobs to stay alive and afford food and all that stuff. And obviously nobody wanted to give them those jobs, which means that they had to commit crimes like robbery and theft in order to survive. So what America did was put people in prison for stealing food and stuff like that. They would make petty theft a major felony so that if you as a black person who doesn't have a form of income was caught stealing food or any necessity, then you would be put in jail for a very, very long time. Obviously these laws aren't explicitly racist. They're not saying if you are black, then we will put you in prison for a very long time for stealing. But if you are white, then we won't. It's not saying that. They're saying anyone who steals will be put in prison for a very long time, but nobody needs to steal if they have jobs. And if you are white, you are most likely going to get a job very easily. Black people were not because nobody wanted to employ them. And because these laws are applied in a way that is racist and targets black people, they're taught from a very young age how to stay safe and not be targeted by police. So parents will teach their black kids stuff like don't talk back to authority figures. I heard somewhere that there was a kid who was playing basketball outside, like in their driveway, and they were taught to like hide behind the car whenever police drove by and they're always taught to you know have the receipt visibly in your hand when you leave shops and stuff like that which is kind of ridiculous like no one should have to put that much effort into little things in order to make sure that they're not going to be put in danger by the people that are supposed to protect them so that's what i wanted to share and now onto the tea so jamie dodger is a trans youtuber who built his following basically documenting his experience with like surgeries and he makes a lot of educational videos about transgender and stuff like that as well. So he found out a while ago that one of his photos was used to promote an episode of this podcast where a transphobic author came on and discussed their views and promote their book, which is just about being transphobic essentially. So this was the photo that was posted. I'm pretty sure it's been deleted off their Instagram, but it was still on their Twitter. And it reads, there are no good long-term studies indicating that either gender dysphoria or I don't know what that word is supposed to be, diminishes after medical transition, which is obviously just a lie, which is not true. But the point that the podcast and the author was making was that transitioning isn't actually good for anyone and that it doesn't help trans people and that transgenderism has just become a trend. And to back this argument up, they mentioned like a study that eventually concluded that when cis girls are exposed to like transgenderism, I guess, and like being trans and what that is, they will want to become trans, which obviously isn't true. Um, It's even funnier when you realize that the study was just a questionnaire that was sent out to transphobic parents and only transphobic parents. The only people that contributed to this study were transphobic parents of children who were trans. Or at the very least, questioning their gender identity. The author heavily detailed and judged the physical appearance of these trans people, usually taking trans men and calling them female looking or describing them with like female features like oh their cheeks are pretty chubby and cute and they look very girly or saying stuff like their body is still pretty female looking because their waist is still kind of sunken in and their hips kind of go out like they focused on this so much in their book whenever they brought up an example of a trans person that would be how they were introduced to the reader they would also mock dysphoria like causing things they'll say stuff like oh their voice is still pretty high for a man they would mock the way that their breasts look and share their opinion on their top surgery results. Obviously they purposely misgendered everyone there, always using the wrong pronouns, and the author also described all of them as sexual predators. I hope we all know that people who transition do get better, if that makes sense. Jamie talks about all of this in his video, so if you want to see it, I'll link it in the description below. The percentage of people that actually regret transitioning is very, very low. Under 0.5% of people regret transitioning, and a lot of those people regret it because they are in transphobic situations where they are 
now like in danger because they've transitioned. Transitioning obviously has been shown to decrease gender dysphoria and increase well-being of trans people. And there have been multiple and consistent studies to show this. Essentially a very oversimplified version of being trans is a difference between your brain and your body. And obviously you can't like fix your brain because you are your brain. Your body is just something that you are trapped in. So your body is something that you can fix. There's no technology available to us right now to fix our brains in order to make us cis. There is however the option of transitioning. So who are you to tell people what they are and aren't allowed to do in order to make themselves feel better? It isn't hurting anyone else. If anything it's a benefit because not only does it help them feel better but it gives people more jobs. Like people now have the option of becoming a surgeon that helps people transition. What do you achieve by taking away trans people's right to transition? Also being trans isn't contagious. That's not how do you like spread a disconnect between your brain and your body and there have been many studies to show that trans people are the gender that they identify as because there are differences in brains and the structure of them between different genders. A YouTuber named Tyler Turner also made a video on this because he was used as one of the examples in the book so if you want to watch either his or Jamie's video on this then both of the videos will be linked in the description down below. So the next thing I want to talk about is Glam and Glore or Mikey who is dating Anthony Padilla. It's been reasonably big news so you might have already seen it. I don't know why the video has so many dislikes but one of Mikey's ex friends a black woman has come out and basically exposed her for being essentially just racist or at the very least microaggressive not only to black people but also to the LGBTQ community so in this video she says that she had a conversation with four white people one of them being Mikey about cultural appropriation and Mikey and another one of the people there had repeatedly been called out for cultural appropriation and they were just saying stuff like cultural appropriation isn't racist they were very apathetic and irritated with the subject Mikey claimed that white people experienced racism and that she herself was a victim of racism and to back up this claim she referred to when black people refused to let her like match their foundation shade when she was working like in a makeup store or something and the reason that they didn't want her to match their foundation shade was because she was white and they were black the people who are involved in the beauty community most likely know that there is an issue with this because time and time again black people have been mismatched with shade not even just like black people like white people who have black makeup artists can experience this as well with being given a foundation shade that is too dark like with bad baby that's just how things are white people sometimes don't know how to match foundation shades to black people even if this wasn't an actual issue even if white people could match black people's foundation shades perfectly that's still not an example of racism. She showed screenshots of Mikey tweeting a lot of racially insensitive things. A lot of people had an issue with this, but she showed screenshots. My opinion, I know a lot of people are like, don't share screenshots, what, like, why would you do that? My take on it is, it's not sharing any personal information, it's just sharing her racism. I'm still not the biggest fan of people sharing DMs, but I totally get why she would, because obviously nobody would believe her otherwise. You can't just come out in 2020 and be like, she's racist and not show any proof. The racially insensitive tweets weren't going to prove anything. It might help some people be sympathetic towards Swoop, the person who uploaded the video, but it's not going to convince anyone that Mikey did anything wrong. So Swoop texted her basically sharing her experiences with racism and I think it's good to add in a bit of context that the conversation wasn't entirely about racism. The conversation was Swoop opening up about her depressive episode which just happened to involve racism and Mikey responded to her supposed best friend opening up about their mental health with it's tough because from my perspective i feel like you won't get handed shit right now on youtube specifically unless you're a minority in some sense of the word be it anything but white or part of the lgbt community but everyone else youtube has pushed in recent years after the era of the tyler oakley's and joey graceffers have been minority or not straight from my own perspective i feel the same thing from the opposite side where i look at two of the most controversial ever beauty gurus growing fucking rapidly one of whom does content no better or more clever than my own and has less talent and does less of the work himself and he still succeeds most likely because because the difference is they're both gay men. So she took this conversation, turned it into, no, I think white people have it harder. And the only reason that these white people have succeeded is because they're gay. I think I mentioned this, but Peter has heard from several active friends of his that they've been turned down repeatedly for roles because they're essentially too white. That Hollywood is mostly only looking for ethnically ambiguous now. And Swoop in this video responded by showing statistics, showing that the lead roles in film are portrayed by white people 80% of the time and everyone else only 20%. Directors are 87% white and 13% literally every other race. Writers are 92% white, 
8% literally every other race. Also, how is ethnically ambiguous supposed to help black people? They're black, they're not ethnically ambiguous. Do you know who is often the most ambiguous? White people. A prime example being the Kardashians. It's a lot easier for white people to take little things from other races to appear ethnically ambiguous and have the benefits from that without having the disadvantages of actually being a person of colour. Mikey also copied a black gay beauty guru without crediting them after complaining about James Charles doing similar videos to hers without credit. The beauty guru Kenneth made a very original video that nobody had ever done before and she, a straight white girl with a much larger following copied that exact video without crediting him. So it's a bit funny how she complains about James Charles doing similar videos to her that she most likely didn't come up with or at the very least wasn't an entirely original idea but then steals a very evidently original idea that nobody has done anything similar to before and she doesn't see a problem with that. Earlier this year when the Black Lives Matter movement got a lot of traction she jumped on the train and started supporting the movement and then she tweeted out claiming that she lost a lot of followers because she supported the movement saying things like I've lost over 10,000 followers this week week or this month because I'm vocal more now than ever about black people deserving rights and I'm so happy to lose all those people they don't deserve to follow me and all that stuff and if you go on social blade or something like that the statistics show that it's simply not true and she was in fact gaining fans and followers which leads to the question why did she tweet those things why did she call it a badge of honor to lose all these followers by speaking up about the black lives matter movement was it because she wanted sympathy was it because she has a white savior complex was it because she wanted to paint herself as a victim of the black lives matter movement similarly to how she has previously painted herself to be a victim of racism despite being a white woman swoop also mentioned things other than racism that just was sketchy to her and made her doubt mikey's loyalty as like a friend and just her morality and stuff like that. Mikey would ask Swoop to lie for her because she was hanging out with another guy while she was dating somebody. She would constantly and consistently talk shit about James Charles and Jeffree Star at the same time that she was using them for clout. And something that Swoop mentioned in her video was that whenever she talked shit about Jeffree Star or whenever she talked shit about James Charles, she would always mention their sexuality. There was a lot of angry vibes from her towards these people and specifically their sexuality. This is where the screenshots kind of get more personal but again it like supports her argument and proves her argument. She shared screenshots of Mikey texting her basically making fun of other artists saying stuff like what is she doing to her face like obviously do what you want to your own face but that honestly scared me scrolling past it. It makes me wonder if she has any clue how far she's gone. I fucking hate YouTubers with a picture of Tana Mojo. Ugh that parenthetical makes me want to vomit. I don't fucking know what that's supposed to mean. I'm pretty sure parenthetical is an adjective. She shared a screenshot of James Charles' tweet which basically said that when he was a small YouTuber a lot of people would decline his offer for a collab because he was too problematic or whatever but now that he's growing and his numbers are a lot bigger then they decided that they wanted to collab and Mikey said this coming from the small influencer kid that I met at BeautyCon in a group of people and he gave zero shits about speaking to me until he saw a brand bring a bag of free things over to me. Then suddenly he lit up and I was so interesting to him. How badly I wanted to say that. Please read the ironic caption and then explain to me why she has no belly button. What is she? Kylie XY? So there were some things that I forgot to mention in this video. So I forgot to mention the stuff that she put in her description which is basically answering a bunch of questions that people had about this video and the contents of it. I find the first two questions very similar. One, The first one being like, did you talk to her privately about this? And the second one being, why did you make this public? If you watched the video, you would know that she tried to talk about it privately. You didn't need to ask. Like, it was pretty clear they had conversations about racism and Mikey didn't want to hear it. They also said stuff like, this is just cancel culture and like, this is petty drama. Excuse me? You're coming at her for trying to cancel somebody for being racist and homophobic. Child, okay. I feel like Jeffree Star and Mikey have a very similar audience, which makes sense because they've been in videos together. But if you are mad at somebody for calling somebody else out for being blatantly racist and expressing homophobic tendencies, you're probably not a very nice person. And the last thing that people had to say about this was that you're not perfect, you've talked shit about James behind his back as well. So just because she's done shitty things in the past, she's not allowed to call out somebody for being racist. Just because she's done shitty things in the past, she's not allowed to call out somebody for being homophobic. This is more than just like cancelling somebody because they tweeted a joke back in 2011. This is consistent behaviour that shows that somebody is blatantly racist and has somewhat homophobic views. If your response to that is, this is petty, this is cancel culture, you're not perfect, you've done things in the past, you should have sorted this out privately, when she's shown in the video that she has tried to sort this out privately, 
is unbelievable. Whether or not you agree with her, whether or not you still support Mikey is another question. It's another issue that you can deal with on your own. But all these common ass responses that she's had to address because they were so frequently asked and mentioned is stupid. They're stupid. Are you serious? Mikey posted an apology that says, Sorry for my behavior in years past and I should have said this sooner. I ignorantly, selfishly, truly have not understood nor did I take the time to listen about others' hardships when I was so consumed and angered with my own problems. I equated things that are not equatable. I've said a lot of things I regret that I don't feel reflect who I am today. I am ashamed of jokes I've made in the past that I excused as edgy humor. I'm ashamed at times I've been incredibly tone deaf and excused that even in past apologies by my well-meaning intentions. If I'm missing the mark, good intentions or not, I'm missing the mark and should have been listening. And some things weren't simply missing the mark, they were just plain wrong. Rihanna mentioned in Bruce tutorial. In truth, I've just wanted them to go away because the thought of addressing it out of seemingly nowhere terrified me. I'm afraid of being condemned for my past actions forever. I've changed a lot in the past two years and I'm so ashamed of who I used to be. How self-absorbed I was, the way I used to direct my own insecurities onto other people, the way I've been so defensive, the way I refuse to listen. But you are owed an apology and I've been too coward to say it. It took me seeing a lot of my own problems through some events I went through last year that very few people in my life know about to start to be open to basics I should have always and wished I had been open to long beforehand. I've been dealing with this privately but I do not like who I used to be and I have been working on this. I have lacked empathy, I have lacked patience, I lack courage. I had hoped my future actions would show that I don't stand by things I've said or done in the past but I should have apologized as well. Again, I was choosing the comfort of myself over the comfort of those I have hurt. This is coming too late and sorry is not nearly enough but I am deeply sorry. Learning how to be a good ally will be a lifelong journey but I want to listen, to grow and to be better. As far as personal things have gone on between Spanky and I, a lot of things were shared or omitted without the full context which does change some conversations but I understand that even without full context that does not make it any less harmful today. It's uncomfortable for me to get this personal online but I do understand my comfort has come at the detriment to others so I need to address this. In short, we were very close at one point. I trusted her and we vented together often about the beauty community. A lot of my insecurities and jealousy issues came through in deplorable ways that were said in anger and frustration. I was feeling bad for myself when I shouldn't have and aimed those feelings at those succeeding around me in an attempt to cope with my own problems. With Spanky, I tried to console her in ways that I hoped would help when she was at a low point and I looked for any upside I thought I could find. But I understand why I was ultimately selfish and way off the mark with how I tried to do that. I missed her frustrations due to my own ignorance and I wish I had been a better friend and a better listener. The truth is I did not know she felt most of these things until now and it will take some time examining my own perspective and listening to learn how it got here as my intent was never to hurt her but again I understand intent is not the end all be all so I take responsibility for how badly my intent did not align with my actions. In 18 and 19 I was going through my own dark things she did not know about at times when I did not reply back to her. It wasn't personal and I alluded to this once but never went into detail about it. With regard to her sexual assault tweets I reached out about them because of what's mentioned in this later text. I assumed this was omitted for my privacy but this was why. Her tweets impacted me as somebody who has struggled speaking about my own experiences because of the internalization of guilt she mentioned. I don't say this to garner sympathy but I wanted to be abundantly clear that it helped me when I saw her tweets which is why I asked if I could share the tweet. When she didn't reply I did not share it. Ultimately it is my fault I didn't realize all the times I upset her over the years and that I did not provide her an environment where she felt safe to discuss this. So please do not give her any hate. I'd like to work it out privately if she wants to talk and if not understand that as well. In my last text to her I mentioned talking about what was going on when I saw she unfollowed me and I didn't understand why she did not reply. I only share this so you understand that I'd like to listen to her and make apologies privately as well. I don't want to piss to her if she didn't want to talk then but with this now I feel like I should try again. I'm grateful she called me out on the things I'm ashamed of from my past because an apology was needed for that and I know she just wants better for those who have been hurt. I hope we can find some kind of resolution for everything else that's happened between us as friends. I'm sorry to Spanky and the BIPOC and LGBTQ plus community who are hurt by this and I promise to do better moving forward. I personally feel like she brushed over a lot of things especially the stuff regarding the LGBTQ community but again most of it was not my apology to accept. If you ask me to summarize it I would say she feels bad for her past actions which I don't remember what what were from this apology alone. Um, she apologized quickly to the LGBTQ community at the end. I don't know what she was apologizing for. I don't know how she hurt Swoop and I think that's it. And the last thing I want to talk about is Megan Thee Stallion and Tori Linez. So for a quick recap, videos were shared around of Megan clearly injured and it was known that it was because she got shot in the foot or feet. And then she came out and said that it was Tori Linez and that he shot her because they were having an altercation. There's not been legal action taken and Tori was in court very recently. Just like the first hearing that you have where they basically like explain what the charges are and what you're being accused of of and you give the plea and stuff like that. He didn't have a plea, I'm pretty sure. It was pushed back because of COVID or something like that. But it's very clear that both of them are lying
lying about certain things. So first of all, the reason that people don't think Tori is guilty is because there was a gun found either in the car or on the person. It was just found at the scene. But it was tested and the gun showed that those shots weren't fired and Tori had no gunshot residue on him. So people were convinced that it wasn't him. But a gun was shot because Megan got shot. It just wasn't the gun that they tested. So a lot of people assumed that there was another gun used to shoot Megan, which is like a very decent theory because how else would she have gotten shot if the gun that was found wasn't shot? But then my question to that is, why could it still not be Tori then? I don't know if technology has changed, but from what I know about the technology that tests gunshot residue and stuff like that, is that like the residue is very easily transferred as well as very easily gotten rid of. Like if somebody you know shot somebody or if they just went hunting or something like that and you came into contact with them, you gave them a handshake, you hugged them, you would get the gunshot residue on you. But you could very easily get rid of that gunshot residue by washing your hands, having a shower, washing your clothes, stuff like that. So if that's still how the technology works and that's still how gunshot residue is like tested, like it still has to be on the person, they can't have like washed it off, then my question is why can't it still be Tori? And some people think that Megan accused Tori to save one of her friends and she seems to be catering a lot to like the black woman experience in order to gain sympathy rather than just telling people what happened. Neither Tori or Megan have come out to confirm the details of what happened first of all and what led up to the shooting But Megan also said in her initial live stream where she told people that Tori shot her She originally said that she was shot in both feet I'm pretty sure that was like exactly what she said She was shot in both feet But it was later confirmed that she was shot in one foot twice Which is weird Like you should probably know how many times you got shot first of all And where you got shot So essentially there are a lot of things floating around but nobody really Really knows what happened because none of them are telling people. Obviously there are a lot of things that you can't say. I saw a post on Instagram that basically introduced me to the theory that Megan the Stallion is a trans woman and the post basically implied that if Megan was trans, which the poster seemed to believe, then she deserved getting shot or that Tori didn't deserve to get punished for shooting her, which no, that's not how it works and her being trans has absolutely nothing to do with this conversation that we're having. So yeah, that's all I have for you guys today. If you liked this video or if you liked me, make sure to like and subscribe. If you didn't like this video, make sure to get in contact with my teachers because I bet you'll have a lot of common and make sure to stay safe and stay hydrated coffee doesn't hydrate you drink water i just don't have water